Hello and good morning, everyone. And welcome to this new Inland Academy session on configuration. Um, this, my name is Greg Parkani, and today I'm going to be sharing with you um, the, um, the information from the configuration session that we just had recently in Stuttgart, ending yesterday in the Doran Hotel. So first and foremost, just um, technicalities of the training. Um, I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay, uh, that you can use the chat, and you have created your account on training.codemer.com. So let's go step by step. We started sharing my screen, and then in the Q&A panel. <clears throat> so please type, type in a question if you can. Um, we got um, a questions panel. Now popping out. So could you please make sure that you, that you um, use the chat and just type in something, say hi. Okay, so I was wondering if you can hear me okay. Please let me know in the chat. There's no point really starting without that. Without that. And I also want to make sure that you can see my screen. Okay, so information from Holger. Hello. Um, sound is fine. Okay, and can you see my screen? I'm sharing um, a code beamer. Okay, um, if not, you need to let me know. So we can use the chat for communication. The audio is disabled right now, and I think it's it's just not on in the meeting. Like I can't unmute everyone due to a restriction on the webinar. So you need to ask questions and make comments. Okay, um, in the chat. So just a quick one there. How many of you have um, have already configured CodeBeamer? Okay, so I'm just gonna ask a question to all of you and ask chat. So <clears throat> Okay. While um while you're putting your answers in, I'm going to get started with a quick overview of um of what's about to come in this training. First and foremost, in the handout section, you'll find the very valuable course material. That is that um, configuration training guide v4.pdf. So that is the one that I'm going to be using for the demonstrations. And you can follow along, you know, step by step from that material. And there was a yes as well so done some configuration already so we have this material i'm gonna try and open it up okay this material shared inside the, um, the webinar okay and i'm just going to give you a quick tour of this one so first of all, <clears throat> to participate in the training, you need to be in the training.codemer.com project. And that's rather unusual. We have, up until now, always used the, the sas.codemer.com, but times are changing, and I hope it is for the better. This training.codemer.com is a dedicated training instance, so we'll definitely not cross paths with people 
who are testing CodeBeamer for the companies. And this is not a test, this is a training. Therefore, we need our own server and our own instance. That is exactly what this is. So most of you will be new to it. So please make sure you navigate to training.codemer.com and then register. So let's see what happens when you, when you do, do that. And all trainings to come will take place in this new environment. That's for sure. So here is training.codemer.com. And then um, you are not a member. So if you have an account on sas.codemer.com, you will not be able to carry that across to training.codemer.com. So therefore, you're not a member yet and you need to register. Registration is slightly easier than it is with, with um, the SAS. So you don't have to, to get through that testing or you have to find the traffic lights or the pedestrian crossings or all of those difficult to spot elements in your environment. This is um, rather simple. You just um, click not a member yet. You specify your details and you're in. Please make sure you register if you're planning to follow along. And I really recommend you do. <clears throat> so register now, username, password, confirm password, friend's name, last name, email, and then off you go. I'm also sharing a lot of um, useful information through that platform. So you need to be in to even get um, proper documentation in terms of, of files, because um, webinar has a restriction on the, on the five types that I can upload. <clears throat> so um, while you're doing that, um, I'm going to keep keep moving. And so move this across. So project browser. <clears throat> First exercise is on page three in the course material, this guy here. And that's about the creation of your own project based on a template. And um, it's a configuration slash key user training. So working with templates is really an essential part of it. You cannot send messages via chat. Also can't configure the webinar like usual. Okay, so comments from Selma. Um, first of all, I can see your, your message, Selma, and um, therefore it is visible. I can at least see this dot, 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 and to all. And the reason is that we have um, a new account for, for this webinar, which we will cease to use. And it has um, like a lower level, lower level status than the other one. <clears throat> so again, the idea was to to separate training from sales and other activities, and for that I got um, a new account created in the GoTo. So I have new GoTo meeting and GoTo webinar, but then this this one um, has some restrictions. So it still allows um, questions. Um, which I can see, uh, like uh, the one coming from Selma, and then it allows mm, the screen sharing. And that's pretty much it, but I won't be able to unmute you. So, so in short, yes, the settings has, have changed and, um, and that's because of the, the account and we'll change them back. So the, f the future is gonna be that other account with those other settings. Um, never mind. So I, I please, you know, I ask you to to register to this new training.codemer.com because this is here to stay. So for all upcoming webinars, we'll be using this training.codemer.com, and then you can just uh, just register. And then you can you can um, pick um, a project called Dorrent Live. So if you go over to the, the project filter and then type in Dorin and then go to the available to join section. So this was 
this one is torrent and then available to join <clears throat> just type in torrent underscore live this is the project that you need to, to join Okay, <clears throat> so let's start from the beginning after you've joined. So, so as Intland Software, we provide a holistic platform and um, a very highly configurable platform to manage your developments, starting from the requirements management all through the successful delivery of software code. And a lot of people use just parts of the system, but one thing is sure, if you're using Inland Software's CodeBeamer, you have trackers that you might want to configure. And that's exactly why this training is so important. In other words, um, this training was created based on our, our own experience with working with our customers. And we're trying to, to get that information across to our customer base so that it can be more self-sustaining or to our partner base so that they can work with us better and make the, the common changes, the common configurations um, in CodeBeamer. Now the agenda is gonna be slightly different. And then as you can see, I mean, we just had a, a partner training session, um, pretty heavily stuffed with information on, um, on CodeBeamer configuration full day. Um, and then another session in the morning, um, day number two. And so today is gonna to be um, a quick recap of that. Uh, but you, while it's a quick recap and I won't be able to take you through every single step myself, you get full access to the course material, uh, which is what I shared in this webinar and in the project. So for you to, to go through the whole training on your own, you need nothing else but access to this training.codemer.com, the, the material, uh, this um, version four PDF file and some enthusiasm because everything is documented in the material. And in this session, I'm going to, to say a few words about the, the why, like the, the reason why certain workshops ended up being in the material and the business value that you can get out of completing those workshops and going through those steps. So this is not going to be like an exact copy of that long session because it cannot be. And, um, and again, I don't wanna rush too much, but um, we wanna make sure that you can complete this on your own and you know what you're doing and you know why. And besides, if you have questions and comments, then I'm, I'm very happy to, to uh, reply to those. So it's just me today. Um, there's no Peter or Daniel or Laszlo. They are the, the ones who usually help me in these webinars. So I'm gonna be, taking care of the questions as well as doing the presentation. Um, and so a question is coming from, from Jacek, for instance, I can only see one project on my per permissions right. So let's just double check those permissions um, in the project configuration. So we need a Dorint live project and then admin and settings. And in here it's set to public. So that's good, that's good. Now, as you log in um, with your own user, <clears throat> there are two things that can go wrong. Okay, one is that you're not on training.codemer.com. I mean, you have to be. You, um, codebeamer.com or sas.codemer.com will not work. So you must be on training.codemer.com, nowhere else. And then the, um, the second important thing is that this project, Dorrent Live, is not yours yet. You need to enter it. And you can only do it by going to the projects available to join section and then filtering it out. So if you just go to your project list, naturally you won't see Dorrent Live because it's open for everyone, but it's not yet entered by everyone. Okay, so that's, that's critical. Please make sure you um, yeah, uh, yeah, check, congrats. 
So you do have access, I, I guarantee you that. I guarantee everyone. It worked with a huge audience <laughs> recently with 50 people from all across the world. So it's, it should be all right. Now, what happens when you're inside? I specifically ask you in one of the, the chapters, material or presentation, don't, don't create transactions in here. It's more for um, like a control center uh, for control purposes. If you go to the documents tab, you'll find some important information on this, this configuration training. Number one, you'll find the PDF that I've already shared with you in the webinar. You'll find a PowerPoint that I'm presenting on my other screen. And you'll find this dorin.zip file. So please download this, dorin.zip. It's a project template file. And it will help you start your project with some, some data inside as opposed to, to just a blank. And um, we'll save ourselves some time because we won't have to um, import data just to have something to work with. And so I'm going to show you the steps and how to create the, the new project. To so download the, the zip file from Dorrent Live, then get out of Dorrent Live, then just hit plus. We're adding a new CodeBeamer project based on the template that I just shared with you. So we say plus, create a new project, and then here's the trick, we attach a file, and that's gonna be dorrent.zip. And then you get a nice pre-configured project. I may use this trick later on as well. And by the way, if you're interested and you have the time, we have recorded both days, day one and two of that Dorrent, Dorrent training, and you'll find those inside that project that I just shared with you, Dorrent Live. So you'll be able to, to watch the recordings and learn from there. They are not available anywhere else. So um, just because you came to this webinar, you now know where to find it. And so let's go back to our initial idea. We wanted to create a new project. So please follow along, create your own project um, using the, um, the zip file, which is torrent.zip. Just click open. I will download it and then click next. Continue with the creation of your project. And so just use torrent underscore and then your initials. Since I already have one, so I'm just going to name it torrent GP1. Torrent GP1. And I'm going to be tricky. And I'm going to name it um, like a medical template, but my trick. We won't have access to this category, so yours will be in the training project category. Okay, so don't create um, your customizations in the Dorrent Live project. It's supposed to be pristine. Please create um, a copy based on the, the template that I exported. And then we can just hit finish. And we have Dorin GP1, All right? Well, your initials. So you should use your initials, Dorin XY, your initials. And then <clears throat> good, you're good to go. And then you'll be able to complete all the exercises, every single one of them in this um, 45 page course material using this one. And when it comes to Word templates, then of course you need um, your Word and your, um, your um, other skills, but nevertheless, you know, you'll be able to do most of it just from here. Okay, so let's um, get into it. So the first workshop is about, about uh, the creation of the project, which we now have. Um, and then you have your project. So overview of tracker configuration. And um, the thing is, <clears throat> before we get into the details, I just wanted to show you um, what, it, what it is that we are trying to achieve with tracker configuration. Why do we configure trackers and what trackers are? So 
before we jump into the, the deep stuff, I think it's it's only fair to look at um, a high level explanation. So in um, tracker configuration, let's start with this slide. So in CodeBeamer, <clears throat> everything takes place in projects. CodeBeamer is all about delivering projects in a highly controlled fashion on time, on budget. And every, all the information that you, you need for your projects are stored in trackers. And so projects have trackers and then trackers have fields that are all customizable. So part of this training will be to modify the field definitions or even add new fields. Trackers have workflows and some of our workshops will focus on guard conditions that we can insert. For instance, in this smooth flow, we can take from new to draft and ready. But what if I only want to allow um, a certain record, for instance, a custom requirement to go from draft to ready, if it has the importance filled out? It's called a guard condition. And so workflows, workflow stages and state transitions come with guard conditions, potentially come with guard conditions at these points, at these milestones. And the guard conditions are going to be described and introduced in this training. Um, as you can see, source code can be connected to any kind of tracker item, but we won't work too much with source code and um, source code related approvals today um, because um, that's kind of that's not done on in trackers in a classic sense. So um, we'll start with um, reviewing users, user roles, um, user groups, and uh, user assignment to groups. And then we'll get into the trackers and see how we can modify fields um, or what might bring somebody to the idea to modify fields in the first place. So, um, I guess that's that's it. Uh, trackers fall into different types. So what you see now is just a high level overview of the most most common types of trackers. And why is that? Because um, we, as CodeBeamer, we we don't do everything. We manage projects that um, in in some key key um, verticals like automotive and uh, medical and, um, avi and avionics and um, we manage run projects. And for, for those things to be done, we need these types of containers or tables. But then if your specific business is somewhat unique, you can modify the contact tracker, you can modify the release tracker or add 10 new fields to user story. But we have a baseline, we have a, have a standard template for trackers. Let's say a user story template would have the typical fields and um, and stuff and workflow setup and and role assignments for a, a typical company that wants to use um, user stories, and then you can start modifying that. So while trackers are highly configurable, tracker types are hard coded in the system. So you will have to choose as you create your tracker, have to choose one of these tracker types. You may ask, okay, why is that? Why can't I use my own tracker type? You can mark your tracker as a template and then that will de facto act as a tracker type. <clears throat> but um, tracker type per se, or in, in its narrow sense, tracker type is a drop down list and you will not be able to add anything to that drop down list. But you can have the power of having like the tracker type, which is in fact a container of typical settings. So you can, you can utilize that tool by marking your, your uh, tracker as a template. <clears throat> and there are slightly more tracker types as you'll see. And I just highlighted the main ones. So what are the main functions that we are, we are serving with our trackers? We store requirements. User story is like a, a smaller requirement that is, um, is used in Agile, Scrum methodologies. Epic is a, it's a bigger container that um, contains user stories that may overlap to multiple sprints and even phases. And then um, requirement and 
high level, low, low level hardware, software, compliance requirements. So all kinds of requirements are classic for most of these um, highly controlled projects in the automotive and avionics businesses. Then, uh, so this is all about the requirements management and they come with connection to risks. And then we got teams and contacts and releases for project execution. Um, tasks are connected to the requirements that will be executed by the teams. Then we, we do tests, in a test case trackers, and then test runs may produce bugs in a bug tracker. And um, we want to hear what our customers want to say in terms of you know, more requirements, and that is what we can track in issue trackers or change request trackers. So this would be kind of like um, a high level overview of, um, of the types of trackers. So throughout this training, we'll pick a certain tracker type and start modifying, but whatever we learn um, will be applicable to all other tracker types as well. So you can add trackers, um, fields to trackers the same way as I will do uh, in this first example. So um, create your own project. So again, I really encourage you to, to follow along. You'll learn much more. And in fact, having the recording, having the course material, you can continue after this session ends and you'll be able to just work through the material. Create your own project. In the following section, you will create your own electric car development project based on a default template with data carefully prepared by the Intland team. You have the steps, you have the presentation, will be good. Overview of tracker configuration. So whenever I need to get involved in a new project, either as a trainer or um, you know, for my own learning purposes or, or um, consultancy type of, um, of engagement, I need to look at the configuration diagram first because I need to know where I am and I, can, I need to know what has been done before in that project. And so I, I, um, if, if I have to start somewhere, I really like to start um, in the most important place and then work from there. And when it comes to tracker configuration and understanding trackers, there's really hardly anything more important than the tracker configuration diagram because it shows you all the trackers and their relationships. So I think that's, that's really the best place to start. And you will have to, to develop the habits and you know, the, the speed to get to the tracker configuration diagram to, to, net, to review what you've done, what you've achieved in your, in your tracker configuration efforts. So to get there, um, all we have to do is go back to CodeBeamer. And there we are. Project-wise, <clears throat> log into your own project. So the one you just created based on the zip file. If you need help with that, please let me know. And, and just like, like I said before, please use the chat. In fact, no, it's not called chat, it's called questions, but um, use the question section. Even if you don't have a question, you want to make a comment. And um, I'll see it, <clears throat> it's on my second screen. I'll be able to react instantly. So recommendation, create your own project, and then we're good to go. So the first one, trackers. Since it's a tracker configuration kind of advanced training, so it's quite understandable. We start with trackers, and then we can get into the configuration diagram. Okay. So the tracker configuration diagram will show us work items that are mostly um, used, used on a day-to-day -day basis and config items that are more for the setup of your project. So again, I told you before, uh, CodeBeamer is a project management tool that allows you to successfully manage large-scale projects and then execute reporting on them. And when it comes to projects, there are things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and things that you, you do more periodically, less frequently. And we tend to put these less frequently used items in the config section, like you set up teams once and then they just have a ton of work to do, but you don't set them up new teams every single day. And so that's, that's the idea behind splitting config and work items. But 
now this is sometimes quite fluid and let's say test cases could could belong to the work items as well nevertheless <clears throat> the configuration diagram is accessible from the tracker overview right here and then by clicking on the configuration diagram link here at the top okay now this is nice and empty which i, I really enjoy so it's like a, a clean slate nothing annoying us mm. but then we want to have some action so let's select the customer and system requirement and there's an arrow that's connecting them um, this arrow um, kind of represents um, a connection between these two trackers on a database schema level um, it's a foreign key reference so to say and um, this is the lower level item that has the, the higher level customer requirement specifications um, reference in there in its table structure and so that's why we have the arrow pointing to the customer requirement specification from the system requirement spec and um, this translates into a downstream reference so the customer requirement specification downstream reference is the, the system requirement when it comes to um, test cases test cases are not directly connected to custom requirements. They are connected to system requirements. Why is that? Because system requirements are technically defined and, um, and typical test cases would, would probably just um, connect to those. But what if we have a new type of test, this user acceptance test, that directly verifies customer requirement? In other words, I, um, I have translated my customer requirements into a system, but then at the end, I want to make sure that the customer um, is happy with what I developed. So for instance, um, everybody wants a nice interior of the electric car that is finally pushed out to the market. And that nice interior has certain system specifications to be able to fit a large touchscreen and um, you know, autonomous driving controls. But um, ultimately, you need to get um, a customer to sit in the car and tell you whether it's a nice interior or not. So you need to, to get feedback from your customer. So having user acceptance tests is important whether you're developing a car or software. So let's establish that link between, between the, the test case and the customer requirement specification. Um, we need to go to the the, the downstream part for the test case and then hit configure. And on the field section, we're looking for a field called subject. Verifies, which will have the property name subject. Now, it's very important. By default, all of our trackers are connected to one another using the um, subject field, which will have a label verifies in case of tests, but it will have um, a label called customer requirement in case of system requirements. And so depending on the tracker, you will have different labels for the same subject field, but even more on a general level, it's a choice field where you can choose work and config items. So that means <clears throat> every choice field where you can select work and config items is ideal to establish connections between CodeBeamer trackers. And you'll see sometimes I, um, you know, fields that are not the subject field to do that. In other words, we recommend that as you're doing your own customization, you follow the principles that we use internally, and that is to establish connection between trackers using the subject field whatever the label. But if you need a secondary link, for instance, you may want to connect um, a test case to custom requirement and system requirement in different fields. You don't want one field which can hold customer and system requirements, but you want two separate fields, one only dedicated to system requirements, the other one only dedicated to customer requirements and nothing else. So like mutually exclusive, connections. That means you need two choice fields. And um, they would both have work and config items, but one would only have system. The other one would just have customer. And um, 
that would be a, a great solution. So all we want to achieve now is to, to connect our test case tracker to customer requirements as well. So we can just come over here and change this to customer requirements and add, add that next to the, the system. So as we hit OK to this one, we now have multiple work and config items, customer and system, and we always must save. So that's, that's a really important part of configuration. Um, you always have to save the changes you've made by pressing the save button. It, there's no auto save in this area of the system. There are, sometimes a tab is enough um, when you're um, say going through them, the properties of um, a detailed document detail view, but this time you, know, you really have to push save. And as soon as that's done, you can go back to the configuration and, um, and review the configuration diagram. So we go back to test cases and configuration. And um, we want to review the diagram. So general, sorry, we need this one. And then configuration diagram. And we already have the three connected. So is the problem solved? Yes, it is, because test cases are now connected to system requirements and customer requirements. And so you notice how easy it is to, to modify that. But um, hey, we want a new type of test, a user acceptance test to be connected to customer requirements specification. And by the way, these, these ideas, these, um, these common requirements are explained page four and five in the course material in that PDF that I distributed um, in the notes of the webinar, in the handout section of the webinar. So please give that one a shot, take a look, and, um, and you'll find all the information and I'll be able to reference the pages, which is, um, I think, really useful. So page, page five is where you get this step-by-step um, this, uh, -step explanation, which ultimately results in this overview. Okay. So if we select um, a bit more of these items, we get a real complicated picture, which is still true. Like bugs are truly connected to tasks and change requests directly or indirectly, but it can be a bit confusing because it's just too much information. So if you click on any one of these, these uh, boxes, you get a change on the diagram and you only see the connections of that box. So test cases can be connected to bugs, and then bugs can be connected to tasks. But the logic is still the same. So for a test case, a bug is an upstream reference. And then for a bug, say a task is an upstream reference. So that means from a task, you can create bugs. Or you know, test runs would also allow you to create bugs, because test runs are also all the way around. <clears throat> Here's a test run. <clears throat> so I guess um, that's it. So you can try and click on different boxes and you'll see how the, the diagram re rearranges itself to show you only the, um, the connections, the upstream and downstream references of that particular tracker. Okay, now what if we wanted to have user acceptance test added to the drop-down list of our um, test case tracker? Remember, we had test cases over here, test cases. We can configure. And then we were able to previously to establish a connection between the, um, the customer requirement just by coming to the fields. Now we can take it a step further and say, hmm, uh, what's the type list right now? Type. I strongly recommend to use the search. So there's so many fields. And you can even show the hidden fields, it's even more. And if you know the, the label, um, this box always searches in the label, which is what's visible to the user. And so we know this, this field is called type on the front end. Uh, so we use that in the search type. And then we can see options. And that's the, the list of options. So a lot of times people have a requirement to, to modify a drop down list, change the the values in let's say the priority or the severity in bugs. And, um, and that's so easy to do. You can drag and drop to change the, the order of appearance. 
So let's say this uh, smoke test can be way up in the list. And you can add a new option, which could be user acceptance test. U P description user acceptance test. Meaning obsolete, not in use folder that's in use, but it's um it's a container, it's not a real um, test case. And information, also not a real test case. So these two types, folder and information, they are system types. They are um they are created by by Intland and can be used to, to group items like requirements or test cases into logical categories. That would be the folder. And information would add information to those logical categories to describe what they are. So these are two unique types that you should not create. I mean, the types you don't create, uh, you could create a new option in those meanings, but you know, it's most, most um, advisable to leave them empty and then it will just be like the other types, okay. And then we can change the order of appearance. So it comes at the top, click okay, hit save. There we go. Now, save once more, just to be on the safe side. And then we can always test what we've done. So going back to the test case tracker, you can use the breadcrumb navigation here at the top to go back and forth. I click on the test cases to get out to the test case tracker, and then I'll be able to quickly create my new test case. So let's say interior design, design, ask the customer if the interior design is favorable. Okay, and then we can just hit save. All right, type of the interior design should be user acceptance test. So it's such a, a small effort really. We're able to establish a new connection. We were able to establish a new type. How can we see the, the new connection, by the way? So as I hit um, the verifies, I can edit the verifies and I can see system and customer requirement specifications. That is the, the change. So previously, we only saw, we only had um, system requirements. Now we also have customer requirements. So may, we may want to add it to the price requirement because I mean, everybody can develop a nice interior for endless amount of money, but we need, also need to keep it under uh, 25 euro. So you can just select, click, add, and then we've established a connection between the, the customer requirement and the test case. And that is only possible because we made the configuration change before. So I'm just wondering if you guys are following teacher exercises or if you're, you're watching now and you're planning to, to do this later on your own. So what's the, what's the approach that the team is planning to take? Please put your response in the, the chat in the question section so I can, I can tell whether um, I can go at the same pace or I should wait for you to finish. What's the, what's the situation? Okay, so quick question, um, are you following along? Okay, so information from Jacek, I'm following. Um, in fact, um, if you have two screens, then it's a lot easier. Um, so with two screens, you can just put me on one and um, I'm really not that fast. So Jacek, thumbs up and uh, we'll keep going. All right, so again, is also being recorded and I'll share it on the internet website. So once this is done, we can go to our next exercise on user roles. <clears throat> now, 
what is this all about? Now let's um, go back to our presentation or my presentation and take a look at that. So we've covered this quick configuration of trackers where we already met um, some realistic business requirements to, to combine trackers. So user groups and roles. User groups are, are um, defined to, to give users access to various modules and um, technical areas or licensed areas of the system. So for instance, um, the user group setup could contain stuff like uh, the user that's assigned to this group must be able to modify um, wiki pages or um, can access the document management module or the requirements management module. So it's kind of high level uh, stuff that's done based on the, the nature of the user. And then one user may have multiple projects and then in each project they will have multiple roles or they could have multiple roles in a project or they could have a single role in a project. And as the color suggests, these roles could be different. So in one project, he may be the project manager and another one, he could be a developer. In the, um, another one, he could be a tester in any combination. And that will translate into various access rights. So we can define within each tracker what a certain role can do. So in other words, our tracker configuration training is mostly focusing on the roles and not on the groups um, or other areas because roles are driving the tracker level access to fields, to key to our main tracker functions and, um, and even workflow um, approvals and workflow um, access. So yeah, they are they are the drivers. And this is why um, I will quickly re review the user groups with you. I'll show you how you can link your user groups to Active Directory um, account or Active Directories. But um, eventually what we'll end up doing, we'll go for, for the role and we'll role. So here we go. Um, I will um, head back to the user group. And so, There we are. Now, where are user groups? So this is something you will not be able to see in your own system because you need to access the system admin tab. Very important, there are two main areas in code. One is the system admin who can access the server that code is running on and modify things that could potentially blow everything up. And um, there's the project admin and by the way, you are project admins in your own recently created project. So project admins can modify trackers in projects, can modify user roles, can de define whatever on the tracker level. Um, and they have full power and control over the tracker trackers within the project. So user groups are, are on the sysadmin level. And I click on that and we can see this is external or guest or regular user. And then as I click on the edit section, I can also see what I can do um, or what a regular user can do. So I told you earlier, it's about um, permissions on higher level or modular level. So um, let's see, a regular user can edit his, his own wiki page, edit if owner. And he can also edit his own account, but he cannot edit other people's accounts and then view addresses and view the company, view the phone, um, create new tags. Um, that's just another way of, of a grouping projects. Enabling review, sort of, um, the review hub, and so on. And this is like a technical one, uh, REST remote API, API access. So it, they can also work with, um, with APIs or app. that um, the API is used to, to connect to the system uh, has to have this checkbox selected. So user groups are defined here. And then on the sysadmin level, you can look at the user accounts. So each and every user account will belong 
to um, a user group, as you can see here, regular user or whatever, most of them regular, but there's some training users, and that will define their access to these core system fun functions. So let's take it a step. Let's take it a step further, so I can look for my own account. Let's see, Gary Barkani. What are my roles? What what kind of roles do I have? We don't know. I mean, not from here. So my account falls into this group, which will define my roles um, on the server level, my ability to come into this area and so on. And by the way, if you want something similar, like similar access, you can install CodeBeamer locally. Um, and um, thanks for the, the input holder, much appreciated. I mean, that's meant to be useful even that way. And again, tools are provided within the training so you can do it on your own afterwards. So we see the group and <coughs> the group configuration, but we can't see anything beyond. <coughs> and that is because it's carefully hidden. And so we need to go on to the project level. So on the project, I pick um, my own project and I can go to admin and members. This is where I can see people and their roles. So for instance, Greg, myself, I'm a project admin, but if I'm also acting as a stakeholder, then I can use that. And there could be fields that are accessible to stakeholders only. I can put validations that you know certain reports perhaps can only be run um, for run by stakeholders, not even by system admin. It's kind of an extreme case. And I can add a new member. So when it comes to adding new members, adding new member from CoolBeamer is available for system admins only. So I can do this. I can come in and say, Cindy, for instance, my test user. But you will, if you ever wanted to add, let's say, a colleague to, to your project, you need to invite them by, by email. And, um, and again, we can also use Active Directory and map Active Directory users to CoolBeamer using this area. But first, we need to, to set that up properly. As we select a new user, we have to select their role, which could be, let's say, tester. And the first exercise, you know, after the, the main kind of intro, um, is to set up a new role for external users. So let's imagine your company is working with um, subcontractors and you want to limit their access um, to system records. For instance, they can only see items that are directly assigned to them and nothing, nothing else, nothing more. So that requires the setup of a new role. And that is what um, the next exercise on page six is all about, user roles. Okay, so there are plenty of roles already in the system. You can assign your roles by drag and drop. So you can modify the assignment of users to roles just by drag and drop. And you can add brand new roles as well. And you can define what those roles mean and what, what people can access in the role. So for instance, if I click tester, um, there are certain like high level access configuration details on the role level. But then as we get deeper into the, the individual trackers, we'll, we'll have um, more and more options to restrict or enable participants in this role. <clears throat> so for instance, we can, we can give them certain workflow, state transition, accesses, and, and so on. So this is the highest level setup for the role. For example, documents, they can add and view documents and unpack. So it's very much like the group level. Um, doesn't have reference to any specific tracker, but what um, you can do, you can override the group settings here. So you can say the user has access to, to the wiki, wikis, but in this project, testers will not have access to the, the wiki. And then um, this is going to override it. So the project level configuration is what, what um, matters in the project. So we are going to get out of this and add our new role. And it will be external, used 
for external members. External. Based on the stakeholder. Right there. And again, the way I play with this and, and change this, I um, you know, it changes the, the default selection underneath. So this is for external subcontractors. Okay, save. And this is now ready. You can see external. So let's add a new member, Edgar. And he will be external. Fair enough, head and ready. Now, for you to test this, um, you will need to add a new, a new member to your project. That can be done by email. So you can invite one of your colleagues um, or again, in your own, um, own instance, you can, you can easily do that. So um, I guess you also have me in your project. If you follow the, the steps, so you, you already have me in your project because I was, um, well, I'm in the backup. So in the, the export version. So you can assign your new role to me. And um, I guess that's also a good, a good exercise. So. Okay, so the next steps in the course material I'll just describe how you could invite somebody to your project, but I guess um, time will not be enough for that. Um, as we did it in a larger group on site, we, we got some students to pair up and we allowed them to invite each other and sort of play in groups. So access rights on tracker level. <clears throat> so the next exercise here is, um, is about the assignment of, of uh, rights on tracker level. So external users um, of your project can only see the requirements that are directly assigned to them. So if we're developing in automotive, we want to make sure that people can't see each other's um, requirements. Engineers don't see things that don't belong to them. And um, we also make the complexity mandatory in status new and non editable in other statuses. And again, we can generalize from that. So let's say in our company, complexity is really important because that's the base of our prioritization. So if something is um, is really important, but highly complex. It will be requires more resources, so it may get pushed out. Um, we want to go for the easy ones, easy and the important ones first, and then we go for the more difficult, more complicated ones. So we need to know what the complexity is, and we don't want to allow our external workforces to to enter requirements without specifying their complexity, because that will then cause issues down the line. And that's um, exactly what we're planning to do. We go to our external users and and I mean, the role external user and modify the, the role configuration. So let's dig in, let's take a, take a look. So we need to go back to the, the, the tracker that we want to modify. And that is the customer requirements tracker, customer requirements specification tracker. And we want to make sure that the external users, well, first, first that it's um, that external users can only see the items that are directly assigned. So more, and then and uh, configure, of course, and then permissions. Okay, so here's the external user, and it says view if any, and that's too much. Okay, we don't want them to see them all. We just want them to see if it's owner. So view if owner. Okay, and whenever I make a change like this, I must hit save. And this is a great moment to stop and think a little bit about all of these tabs at the top, because this is a tracker configuration training. These are trackers in a configuration mode. So a lot of times in the user guide, I'll just tell you to go to the configuration of the tracker. That's this one. And you can get here multiple ways but I guess the easiest is through you know, the, the tracker overview and then right click the tracker and then configure. But you could also get there from the detailed or document view of the tracker. 
So in whatever way you get to the tractor configuration, and these are your main tabs. So let's say a few words about those. So the general one is um, that one, the one that has a tracker type and, um, and also the description. Permission is what we've been playing with. Um, permissions define um, what can be done by which role. And um, at the bottom of the screen, it also gives you an overview of the, um, the intermingled relationship between these, these properties. So we all understand that if you can't see it, you, you won't be able to edit. But in the other one is possible. So maybe you want to view, but you don't want to allow the user to edit. Um, so, so these kind of relationships <clears throat> are like view and, and edit. Um, and all of these are, are connected to each other. And so sometimes when you select uh, an item, the other one is not selectable anymore. So for instance, um, here we got edit if owner selected. The view if owner is now grayed out, cannot be removed. As I remove the edit, I can also remove the view. Not that it makes a lot of sense. So <clears throat> again, um, some of these settings are, are overlapping or dependent on each other. And therefore we have this extra section at the bottom. State transition is one of the most exciting part of it. This is where we define what stages, the, in this case, the requirement or the tracker can go through into workflow states and workflow transitions. So this item will start its life with new. So a customer requirement will come into the system and will become a new customer requirement. Now, if it came in through you know, specific um, pre-authorized channels, it can go from new to accepted immediately, or it can go from new to rejected, and then it will get pushed back. Or um, from rejected, it can go back to draft, so it, it gets some rework, and then it's waiting for approval and then accepted. Whatever is the scenario, it has to be managed with these you know, five workflow states as of now. And the arrows between them represent potential transactions or movements. But the interesting part is that you can just click on one of these boxes and modify what needs to happen as an item enters that stage. And uh, you can update the item properties. Again, let's say have a field started like a Boolean and then set it to yes, or execute a custom script. So you can, if you're familiar with programming, you can also write your program code and execute it as um, the item hits a certain stage, create a new project baseline. So there's a ton of options that you can do as an item reaches a stage or when, when it gets updated or on exit. And then as you click on um, this arrow that's connecting the, the states, uh, you can see again, which role is allowed to make that status change. And then they can do it on what condition. And then there's also a guard condition, which will flat out break the process if the user uh, doesn't fulfill certain prerequisites. For example, you can only push something into the accepted status if all of its um, downstream references are in the status accepted. You can only accept custom requirement if uh, all the suspected, all the, um, the system requirements are accepted. These kind of, of ideas. <clears throat> and so what we try to do in this workshop and in the course in general, to give you some ideas on how these can be used practically. Uh, and therefore, uh, you also familiarize yourself with, with the tools themselves. And so <clears throat> business cases and then scenarios, but um, they, they tend to use the same toolkit. So we, we look at the, the state transitions and the guard condition and the, um, we add a new workflow status in one of the exercises at status. So it revolves around, around this part. We already looked at the permissions. We looked at the roles. And so fields, we already checked out the, the verifies field on a test case. Again, you can see the type choice, if choice, and, and there's allowed work items, then for example, this one choice really is multiple work items. So this establishes the connection between 
the custom requirement and the release. And um, it's, a, it's a choice item, so you can, you'll be able to search for releases and select them. And then this also provides traceability. So you can use the, the traceability browser to start with releases and then look at, let's say, all the work items in a certain release. Because everything you see here is, is part of traceability and therefore displayed in the traceability browser. Escalation, you can define escalation path, usually using support centers or when you're working with issues or bugs, something is really urgent, you've got a special contract with your customer and they submit a bug, um, you can escalate and therefore bypass the normal, normal procedures, the normal uh, workflow. Notifications can be sent out via various um, chat tools like group or organizational chat tools like chat ops. But um, in the, the current system, we're using um, plain old email. So as soon as you register for this and you start um, making changes in your project or you've got somebody joining your project, you, you'll get notifications yourself. Audit trail is gonna show you what has changed in the tracker. So not only are we tracking data, we're, only tra we're also tra tracking the changes made to the individual trackers. So for instance, this had 35 field changes because the field was created as we imported that um, the zip file. Um, we can also look at the, the workflow changes. And again, this, this is mostly the, um, the change that took place as it was created from nothing. There's one, yeah, so these are quite limited, limited changes on the creation, but as we, we make more changes, you, they will always be uh, visible here. And then finally, the service desk is, um, is going to allow you to send the, the current tracker out to the service desk module of CodeBeamer, to, which is optimized for service organizations that um, collect support cases and issues and react on them. So that will be our service desk module. Again, in, in these exercises, we, we mostly focus on the first few tabs of field changes, state, state transitions, permissions, we already started. And we have configured the permissions so that we can only see, uh, in externals can only see their own items. Well done. Now, uh, we wanna go down to the complexity field and make sure that complexity is mandatory in the new status to make sure that as externals put their requirements in, they don't forget about complexity. So we go to fields and then start search for complexity, complexity, and make it mandatory in status new. Okay, so this time onwards, or this moment onwards, we'll have to enter, but only after I hit the save here. That's critical. I have to always have to push save once I'm done with the configuration. And, um, and then we can, we can test it out. So once we're ready with the, the configuration, we we'll always give it a, a test run. So custom requirement specification, first of all, to be able to, to thoroughly test it, I'll need to log in as, as um, my external user, Edgar. So I will navigate to Chrome and then go to log out and then log in. So I'm in this GP1 project. And then I can navigate back to trackers and custom requirements specification. Oh, not many custom requirements today. And we know why, because it's just not, not um, allowed for me to see, see those, those items. So what I can do is go to this um, chassis. So get back to the chassis and assign it to Edgar. There we go, so external. Okay, so what's the situation now? 
I hit refresh, organize that car. And then no items added yet. It's a fitting issue. So chassis, edit two, assign to Edgar. Oh, yep. Tab. So as we tab out of the field, notice it gets a timestamp. And that's the moment it saves. So there's no save button, but, but we really do need to save it. And then it will work. Here we go. Okay. And then as I click new, like I try to hit a, a new item. Mm. So I'm going to say GPS requirement, GPS requirement. Okay, try to save it. And complexity. Ah, I see. So the, to avoid errors, this screen always uh, adds a value for empty records to enable the addition of, of records. So to really see our, our um, validation, I need to come over here, a new, and I'm just gonna say test, test. Mm -hmm. So complexity, not mandatory. Interesting, interesting. More configure field and complexity. It's mandatory and all except new. Okay, that's not good. Um, it should be like um, all, no, just new. So now it's going to work. So what I accidentally did, I left the all checkbox selected. But if I do it this way, I'm saying it's mandatory in the new status. Click OK and save. Then get back and try to edit this one. Summary. You can immediately see the complexity as being mandatory. Just trying to save it without it. Complexity value is missing. So that's how it works. You need to, to have this development loop and testing loop intertwined. You need to be able to, to see what you're doing and, and test what you're doing. And then you can easily spot problems and fix them. So, <clears throat> so what we've just accomplished, we restricted our external subcontractors access to, to um, requirements allowing them to access their own only, and also made mandatory for them to enter the complexity value. And we could also have done this on the, the status level uh, for this role only. So we could, we could have said, if I want to enter a new requirement, I can do it without complexity, but an external user must use complexity. So how would that be possible? So go back to the definition of the field, narrow down to complexity, and we just said mandatory here, but let's remove it. So I'm just going to say okay, none. Um, it's not mandatory. Okay. Save. It's no longer mandatory. But I can say see um, per status. And then who can read or mm, so these are the, the permissions. Yeah, in terms of mandatory, I think I can just do it there. So mandatory in status all. Mm. Options allowed and default values. We can specify what's allowed and what's the default. No, I think um, I think that's that's what we can do for now. 
specify which status, whether it's mandatory or not, but we can't say it's mandatory for whom. So that was, um, I confused that with the permission, which is, um, which is really by role, but it's, um, it's their edit or um, write or edit, read and edit um, definition. But whether a certain role can modify it, that, that can be done on the status level, that's for sure. But making it mandatory is, um, is on the status level, not on the role level. OK, so in the next workshop, we're going to create a brand new tracker. Mm. We have learned how to modify the relationship between existing trackers. We have zoomed in on a specific tracker to modify its fields and its, uh, its roles. Mm, and, uh, and we also used our newly created external role. So it's time to, to get into the, the creation of a brand new tracker. And that also raises um, one logical question. So why would somebody go into the creation of a new tracker? What would be the, the reason, the business case for the creation of a new tracker? And, um, and to explain that, I'd rather go back to Codebeamer again and to one of our industry-specific templates. So here we are. We're just going to, to venture out of this for a moment. And we're going to go into the automotive project. So Inkland's automotive project template, ISO 262 features a much higher number of trackers um, than the default template that you just saw. And these trackers are organized in hierarchy. So for instance, system requirements spec, which is there in the default, is split into hardware and software, and then safety goals and technical safety concepts and functional safety requirements. And these structures were created absolutely in line with that ISO standard that is referenced at the top. If you read those chapters and the explanation of the, the standard, it has these as chapters and details. So yes, if you want to follow that standard and you want to split your requirements into hardware and software, um, and you want to make it absolutely clear, so it's easily traceable, well, it's best to create dedicated trackers, dedicated containers or tables to store the data. And that's exactly what we did. So in this template, we created a new tracker called hardware safety requirement, then underneath another one, hardware architecture. The hierarchy you see here is also not visible in the previous project, but that's just a display thing. So as soon as you get into multiple levels of trackers, it's a good idea to use drag and drop to rearrange the scene. So here is, um, my other project, GP1, and we already found out that system requirement is somewhat below the customer requirement. But to display that, I really need to do this. Or we can also say test cases are not, not really work items. They are, but they, they are not config items, they are work items. So I can move the test cases up here and then test runs would always be connected to test cases. So you can rearrange this. And that's only for the display. So some, if somebody joins your project, takes a look at tracker configuration, they immediately, instantaneously know what this is all about, what kind of trackers you have, and how they are organized. Uh, as opposed, to, uh, you can have a flat display if it's a very simple project or kind of a default template project. And then you need to, to take a step further and look at the configuration diagram. So. You can still look at the configuration diagram here, and that will serve the same purpose as before. So we can further analyze and review um, the relationship between trackers. So anyway, so this was just to answer the, the rhetorical question, why would we want to, to create new trackers? This is the reason to meet certain standards, or if those standards are already met because you purchased a, a template, okay, but you still want to configure that further to meet your organizational um, requirements, reporting requirements, or um, simply to automate certain things. In, in general, if you, if you wanna have, record, have trackers with different workflows, so one may have three stages, the other one may have five, you need to create them as separate trackers. And another good reason is the field configuration. 
So if one has five fields, same type, the other one has um, 16 fields, they are highly likely to be treated as different trackers, like we saw before with the hardware and software. So <clears throat> the next exercise is going to, to cover the same concepts that we discussed before, with this user acceptance testing. So instead of, of um, taking the, exact, uh, the existing um, tracker and sort of connecting it, we may decide that we want user acceptance tests to go through a different sort of validation and approval process. So it makes sense to separate them from the rest of the test cases. And that's indeed what we can do by coming to the trackers and just hitting plus and adding a new user acceptance test case. So the type is going to be test case. And as I said before, it will drive default permissions. It will drive a default set of meaningful fields. And also, some of the other characteristics of test cases, like um, the fact that they have steps. You know, every test case has, a ste has steps. So by selecting the type test case, I'll have steps on the, on the tracker, whereas if I selected, let's say, requirements, it probably wouldn't have steps. So type test case, template none. And by the way, I could select any other test case that is marked as a template. Name-wise, I'm just going to say user acceptance test, just like this. Short name UAP, color pink, and then <clears throat> I guess that's it. We can hit save. Or we can enter a description. Sorry, that's also mandatory. UAP tests save. Okay, um, so at this point, uh, this tracker is not connected to our customer requirement. It's connected to the system requirement because that's the default configuration of test cases as we saw earlier. So I want this to, to just be connected to customer requirements and nothing else. But you know, I can remove all the others as well. So if it's user acceptance, I don't want that to be connected to user story. I want it to be a customer requirement related item. Okay. And then once you hit OK, you have to go and click Save as well. And so state transitions. This is where you can specify the workflow. And um, right now, uh, we need to go back to the tracker overview. Trackers. And then user acceptance test is somewhere here. I can decide where it should go. I believe it is a config item, just like other test cases. Or I can move it over here under the other test cases. And then look at the configuration diagram and make sure we, we show, show. Well, let's just click user acceptance test. So I'm going to hide everything else and put user acceptance test and customer requirement back. And now I have system as well because that's underneath. But you can see how system requirements backs are connected to customer and user acceptance tests are also connected to customer. It's always a good idea to, to try it out. So once you're, you're ready with this, you can go to your customer requirements backs. And then from a customer requirement specification, chassis, you can hit plus. UAP test. And that's the power of those downstream references that you can go to an upstream one and create the downstream reference with the plus add new downstream reference. So in terms of chassis, you no, know, test the chassis. It's good enough. Okay, so what we've done now or what we've covered is um, just a brief example on the creation of a new tracker. And then again, if we're in training, I would encourage you to, I mean, uh, live training, I'd encourage you to try and create your own trackers of different types. And also make sure that you connect them to the, um, the landscape uh, of trackers. So the connection is best established with the verifies field, although you can use other fields to, to connect that and then propagate suspects 
it's also important because um, suspects um, indicate some kind of a change upstream that may have an impact on the downstream item. And believe it or not, I did forget about this. So how can we go back? I need to go back to trackers, configuration, UAT test, save. And then in the, the fields, I want to go for verify. Hit the label. And then propagation of suspected links. So just a bit of navigation. I mean, you need to be able to, to create iterations of your changes. So the, the suspected link propagation is configured on the field level. Which field? The field that is responsible for the, the connection. And that is um, the subject field. Um, you click on the label. It will take you properties. And that's where you propagate suspects. Click OK. And in a minute, I'll show you what it means and what's the power of suspects. So um, we have, um, let's um, go to UAT test. And then and we can go back to the, the upstream reference. Customer mm -hmm. <clears throat> client specifications, chassis properties. Here we go. So we can see that it's connected to this uh, user acceptance test case, test chassis. And at this point, it does not have the the um, reference propagation active. So we can just try again, user acceptance test. Um, test chassis two. And you can immediately see the suspected link. So it really depends on, on the timing. <clears throat> but at this point, suspected link propagation was active. Here it wasn't. So what that means is um, if I make a change on this one, the high level one, um, the, the test case will have a suspected flag. And um, <clears throat> that is important because it's kind of a, a warning sign. You don't want to be testing something that's no longer a requirement. So if you wanted beige color originally, but then we changed our mind and it's now gray, you shouldn't be testing if it's beige. Um, it's already um, not valid. So as soon as this changes, we need a warning sign to appear on the, the lower level items. And you know, up until now, up until today, as we got into configuration, it's kind of a given. A lot of our customers just ask me, why, Greg, why do I see so many suspected links propagated? What am I doing wrong? Um, and the, the answer is nothing. There's just um, a connection, a reference type connection between the two objects. And that reference is set up so that it propagates suspects in your best interest. And if it's not your best interest, you can turn it off. <laughs> now you know how. You just need to navigate to the field that's responsible for the connection and then remove the propagate suspect checkbox. Same way as I selected it, you can also uncheck it. Again, the impact is nice and simple. You can come over here and say chassis um, color and save. And then it's immediately suspected. But as I go back to the test cases, let's say we look at the list of test cases. One has a suspected link, the other doesn't, but they all come up in the list. And um, let's see if I can add the suspected column. Nope, not here, too bad. But I can also add a filter, common references, um, has a suspected link, suspected field, link filters. And that's what I want to do. So it has suspected link, true, and then go. And these are the ones that I need to analyze or keep an eye on. Okay, I'm talking about eyes. You can save this as a view. It has um, name with suspected. And then I'm going to save, and then it will be so easy for me to just jump back into those that have a suspected link problem. Once again, 
this test case is verifying the old configuration of the requirement, the old setup of the requirement. So I may want to come back and check out that traceability because something has changed. And that is that, that word color appearing there. Once you have reviewed the changes and then sort of modified your test case, you can easily remove it just like this. And again, this is not new. If you follow the application training um, presentations of Inline Academy, you've seen this before. But um, the novelty part is that we now know how to establish a connection with or without suspected links. So <clears throat> let's do one more last workshop um, and um, then um, we'll wrap up and, and um, kind of summarize what's left and summarize what you can do um, to follow up. So um, we will add a new field and that is um, a date type accepted at. So let's quickly switch back to the presentation. Okay, so we add a new field. We configure the customer requirement tracker. We'll add a new date type field and name it accepted at. We'll add state transition, um, the status accepted. And then on entry, we'll update the item properties with today. So what is this all about? Status changes are tracked anyway. So you will not lose the information just because you don't have this custom field. But for, let's say for export purposes, exporting into a different application, exporting into Word, maybe a good idea to not just have it as a, as a history record that can obviously be viewed from CodeBeamer, but not from Excel after an export. But I wanna have the, the accepted date as a date field right there on the tracker. So it can be exported, so it can be placed on the UI. And that's exactly what, what we're going to do. We're going to configure this tracker to add a new field. So it's a brand new field. And then we make sure as it reaches the accepted status, it will, the new field will be updated and will store that information. So it's um, a nice uh, small challenge. And so let's, let's give it a try. So we will go back to the customer specifications. Uh, so trackers and then custom requirement specification and configure. Mind you, these steps, these um, configuration ideas or concepts would work on any tracker. And first of all, we want to add a new field. That's something we can do on the field tab, scrolling down to the bottom, more fields, and then we'll say new custom field. So again, more field list drop down and then accept it at <clears throat> type, it should be a date field. And then um, we are going to, well, let's just create it. And there's nothing else we need to do. Not a computed, not nothing else. Okay, save. So very important before we do anything else, let's hit save so that it gets embedded in the structure. And now it's, it's work, it works. So then we go to the state transition tab, state transition, and then accepted. And then on entry, we want to update the item properties. So you can put custom actions on workflow state transitions and workflow state. And it's accepted, it's a workflow state. And so as I click on the accepted, just say on entry, update item properties, um, no condition, um, just unconditionally, um, and then accepted at the new field. And I want to set, set it to the value of now. So it has the date and timestamp. Now the, the okays are a little bit challenging here. So you have to press okay first so that this section of the assignment statement um, gets saved. And then you hit okay here to, to um, accept the whole definition. You could have multiple actions, 
multiple types of actions, multiple actions listed in the on entry. So you could, it could do this and this and this and this. So when you say, when you're done with the custom session, you have to click OK and very end, you have to click save. And again, um, these are just some of the customization options that could take a much longer in other systems. And it's um, what we've done um, deeply, deeply um, um, resonates with the concept of, of simple configuration, the easy customization um, on CodeBeamer. So I think we're we're ready. Just need to test it. So I'll, I'll review once again what I've what I've done. So on the fields section, I created a new date type custom field called accepted at. I can always review it and see the, the description or even hide it under certain conditions. It's coming later, make it mandatory in certain statuses. statuses. Um, so you can always review your field clicking on the, the label. Um, then we combine something that we've already looked at but haven't utilized. Um, we combined the, um, the status-based workflow configuration. We click on accepted. Then we just say update item properties. Well, that's to now. Accepted at is set to now. And um, just click OK. And OK. And then since we haven't made any changes, uh, we don't need to save. Remember, we are in the custom requirements pack, so we're best off testing it right there. And then we can navigate to the IR chassis requirement. At the moment, the accepted at is there, but it's not, not um, it doesn't have any values. I can then go into the status because I'm kind of a super user. I can push it into the define stage, still nothing. And then I can keep pushing and accept it. And immediately it stores the, the date right there. So our configuration change, our customization is now active and is ready and is available. Okay, so since we've been going for over an hour and a half, um, I um, would really like to open this up for questions. Mm, and um, I would also like to review what's left of that training material um, and that you can do as a homework on, at your own time, at your own pace, and, um, and make sure you experience a little bit more of uh, CodeBeamer's configuration potential. So again, please put your, your questions um, in the chat. I'm pretty much looking forward to it. And I'll explain while, while you're thinking about your questions, I'll explain a little bit more about the user guide that I created for this um, on-site event. So we have gone through the user right assignment and then creating the new tracker. Okay, we've added the new fields, automation driven by workflow action. In fact, this was already a kind of automation. So updating an item property automatically, that's automation. But we have more of the, that automation. So uh, we get into the, the realm of, of cross workflow action, cross tracker workflow actions with workshop automation driven by workflow actions and workshop automatic creation of baselines. Both kind of go beyond the one tracker. And, um, and uh, the first one, creates a new user, new user acceptance test case record as soon as the, the item reaches the accepted status. And this one fulfills more of a, a project management kind of requirement to create an automatic baseline as soon as you close a new, a new release. Guard conditions will do kind of the opposite instead of automatically doing it. Yeah, they will not let you do it until you fulfill a certain requirement. The tools that we're using in these workshops are pretty much like the ones that you've already experienced. So guard conditions can be inserted on the, the workflow um, state transition. So you hit, click on the arrow and then you can, you can define the guard condition as per the course material. Adding a workflow status or workflow state transition is um, it's just like that. And then creating a new, a new tracker, um, it's just an exercise. So we will not have the steps 
clearly written down. Instead, it will just have like a challenging high level definition of the exercise. But if you get to this point, you've completed all the exercises before and you carefully understood the concepts in the system, we'll have no problem completing this exercise here, create and configure a new tracker. It will be a joyride. And then there's like a, a bonus, bonus track, Scaled Agile Program Management. It features similar tracker configuration tricks um, as the ones before, but it's just um, doing it in a different um, area. And that is um, connecting releases across projects. So instead of, of connecting, let's say, trackers, uh, other trackers like requirements um, within a project, we, we connect releases of different projects. And therefore, you can have like a top level project, which, which um, is like the program management project, and all the sub projects in a, a scaled agile rollout will appear underneath in the, the release tracker. So it's, um, it's a more advanced use case, but the, the, the things you need to do are exactly what we've, we've been covering. So you need to go into the, the configuration of the releases, you need to make a change there, and you will need to, to then test and see how uh, the release will show up in the top project. So these are the ones, like the ones I demonstrated, give you solid foundations on where to look and how to, to make changes. There are some other workshops that um, will be left as homework because of the time constraints that it's not a whole day training. And then for, for next week's similar session, um, I strongly recommend you, you complete everything up to this point. We'll look at the high diff, the calculated fields, and then um, go for further and, um, and even look into the project templates. So these advanced configuration items that require real unique explanation and the new word expert template is coming same time next week. So with that, I, I'm checking the, the Q&A, but nothing came in. Um, thank you very much for, for joining the session. That was me, Greg Parkani from Intland Academy. And I really sincerely hope to see you next week. Take care and goodbye.